hesitate to ask the difference in charcoal and graphite. Excellent question. Uh, so what I'll do is I'm going to play a little segment and then I'll stop and see if there's any questions or any comments. If you have experience with these um, particular techniques or something similar, please chime in. There's no sound yet. Oh, so the first thing is uh, bacon trays, microwave bacon trays. So I use these to keep my pencils in. I've got a little strip of foam down there at the bottom. Can everybody hear that okay? Okay, and it's gonna be a little jerky. Again, I apologize. I will be sending all these links to you today so that you can, hey, Ella. Hi. <laughs> Glad you're here. We just got started with the video, so. Hey, um, Christy. Yes, Amy. I was trying to find, where is the, uh, can I, am I able to see where you drew the eye and stuff? Because I went back looking at stuff because I missed that. No, I, I I didn't post that, but I did send you the original eye, and I didn't do a step by step on the eye. So, oh, that's why I couldn't find it. Okay, right? No, no, no worries. Um, okay. Thanks. All right. So okay. here is the. Um, I wanted to make sure that the volume is okay. If you have a lot of background noise, if you'll just hit your mute button, and then when you want to talk, if you're on a computer, you can just hold your space bar down while you're talking. You don't have to unmute yourself every time. You can just hold the space bar down while you talk and then let go of it. Uh, this first segment is Megan. Um, and I, again, I'll send you those. Her name is Megan on Twitch, if you look for her on YouTube. And she's a really good graphite artist. But here's a few tool tips. Then got a little strip of foam down there at the bottom just to protect the points when I... That is a bacon tray, a microwave bacon tray that she has her pencils in. And again, she just said she put a strip of foam at the bottom and a little piece of elastic around it to hold her pencils in. Drop them back in. And I write what the lead hardness is so that I can just, you know, sort of at a glance, um, grab the pencil that I'm looking for. Same thing with the mechanical pencils. This is really helpful, especially because I can never keep track of like what pencil has which lead in it at the time. So I just write down, you know, what, what this point size is, the lead size and the hardness, and that way I can just grab them. Uh, another thing is the Tombow Zero, Tombow Mono Zero erasers. These are great because they are so tiny, right? I mean, that, that little tiny point, you just, you can't beat that. The problem I have with them is that the, the eraser tends to spin in it, so it'll sometimes pick up and smear the graphite um, more than anything else. So what I do is actually keep the, take the eraser refills, um, and I put them in clutch pencils. So, you know, you need an actual like clutch, not, uh, That's her not a drop in pencil. Um, but you just pop it right in there and then it, it doesn't spin, it grips it really firmly and you're good to go. Uh, I actually keep two of them because one of them. I wanna pause there for a minute because I looked up a clutch pencil. I have never, I don't know about that. Yeah, so it, it's, hard, it's hard to tell on the Amazon link if it's one that you just tighten or one that actually has little claws and it clutches that eraser. But I have had that problem with that little mini eraser that it spins around when you're trying to get in there and do little tiny things, but it's my favorite eraser of all. It's so tiny. Um, and I'll be sending you a link for that as well. I'll keep cut at an angle for really sharp, you know, tiny little areas. And then uh, when they get dirty, because sometimes the tip will just start getting dirty, um, I actually have some putty up here and I'll just kind of stab it into the putty and clean it off. Um, so that always stays there as well. Um, let's see, next thing is uh, drawing gloves. You know, I have this like, you know, it looks funky. It's like something out of flash dance. But um, these are really handy for when you're drawing and you, need, you want to or need to rest your hand on the paper. This, you know, especially since I have a drawing board, I'm not rotating the paper. Sometimes I need to, you know, be like this or, you know, at a weird angle. Um, so I don't have to worry about transferring the oils from my hands onto the paper. Um, you know, I can just go for it. I mean, it, it will like smear very slightly and you know, you'll notice that like the white turns a little darker, but it's super easy to clean up and uh, has, has really like changed my life. <laughs> so, um, oh, another thing, uh, putty. You know, a lot of people use putty. The only thing I use needable erasers for is picking up eraser shavings off of the paper. Blue tack is super po popular for picking up extra graphite. Um, you know, it's formable, it's sticky, you can get it into those tiny little places. But this stuff, this is called Aline's Craft Tack, um, A-L-E-E-N apostrophe S. It is stickier than blue tack. It's just as formable, you know, it's still firm, you can get, you know, tiny little points if you need to. 
um, but much, much, much stickier. So if you're trying to you know, go all, all the way back to white in some places, you can do it with this stuff. And one of the things that helps with that actually is that I never use blending stumps anymore. These are color shapers. They're made for, uh, for pastels and clay, actually. It's just, you know, it's got a silicone tip. Uh, not in focus here. It's got a silicone tip. Um, this one is actually a chisel that I cut down to shape. Um, can get into little tiny spaces, and then I have bigger ones for doing larger areas. Um, this one is Royal Sovereign, but there's a bunch of generic versions as well. Um, but these are great. And the other thing about these is that, you know, you can wind up like drawing with them. You know, they work just like blending stumps um, and they don't destroy the tooth of the paper. That's the best part, right? So, you know, if I did want to go back all the way to white with the Aline's Craft Petty, you know, I could do that. Actually, I'll show you real, real quick. I actually, I really do think that this stuff is better than the blue tack. So, you know, just kind of pick it up. And because I haven't gotten all the way down into the tooth of the paper, um, most of the time I can I can get all the way back to white in, in like little tiny areas, you know, which is great if I screwed up because a lot of times I do. So, <laughs> um, you know, and then, you know, you just come back in and blend back in or whatever, do whatever you need. Hi everyone, and welcome back. Okay. So okay, let me pause right there. So she mentioned several products and I'll send you the links to these in case you're interested. I know Carla, I believe it was you that took a colored pencil class and got some good tips for um, putty that was a good eraser. Um, Sticky tape is what I think mine was. What was it called? Sticky tape, wasn't it? Sticky, awesome. yes, like sticky tack. Sticky. Something like that. Yeah, the stuff you stick on the on the wall with. And, and I order some of that and I use it sometimes and it works really good. You mean like so, museum putty? Yes, museum putty, yes. Oh, okay. And it works great as an eraser for, you know, like she, she, uh, and she's a little bit, she, she's a little bit hyper. She got a lot of information in, in a couple of minutes there. So sorry about the shakiness and the, how fast she went, but, um, there were basically, a, huh? she, the glove was? I'm sorry. The glove. the glove. Oh yes. The, the drawing glove. And I'll, I'll send you the link for that. They have that on Amazon. Um, you can buy a package of, two of them for you know six dollars or something they're 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 just one finger they just go over your hand and they cover your pinky finger and that way when you lay you know you're you're not laying in, in your it's better than the piece of tape that we saw last week in an index card so i never knew those existed did you guys that was a brand new thing for me drawing gloves and you could just throw them in the you could wash them out in the sink or something you know after they get charcoal or graphite on them so um, I thought that was a great, a great thing. So, hey, Catherine, <laughs> welcome. No pressure. You just stay at your own pace. We're, we just started the video se se segment and I've encouraged anybody, if you have any experience with these items or um, you want, you have anything to share to just jump in there. I'm going to pause between each little segment in the video. Um, so this next seg segment, the the um the guy's name uh, the the youtube channel is smoothie 77 <laughs> i don't know what his name is but i'll send you this link as well you can watch these videos in their entirety if you want to i'm just giving you little clips of the highlights of what i found to be helpful and new and he's going to show some new some different blending tools um, and I'll also send you the links for those. So don't worry about trying to write them down. I'll send you the exact link because he has them on his YouTube page. It's great. He has a whole, the whole nine yards. So you're going to love it. And you can be able to hear him a little bit better. But today I'm going to show you five new blending tools, um, graphite blending tools, which you've never seen me actually use before. You've probably seen me use, um, paper blenders, cotton swabs, cotton wool, brushes, tissues, all that kind of stuff for blending. You can even use microfiber cloths, um, chamois leathers, tissues, anything like that. The first one, the Stella Norris um, stylus pencil. It does work, but it's like I say, it's not my most favorite blending tool. Um, the favorite blending tool is one I, I... Let me pause it right there because I looked up this Stedler stylus pencil and he does demonstrate that um, it's a stylus you know is meant to be used on your phone or on a ipad the little rubbery end 
and it is a regular HB pencil as well. He did not really like it very much. It did not blend that, that well. So I didn't record that segment, but you can go back and look at it. It is a nice little portable drawing tool to have with you. If you just want a pencil and it has a little bit of a rubbery end that you can sort of blend with. So you don't have to carry a stump and all that stuff with you. So I wanted to mention that. This next little segment is his favorite tool. And you, he'll, he'll talk about these. You can order a whole pack of a hundred of them. Um, so I want you to hear his experience with these. Found it's this, it's a sponge applicator. Um, I think it's used for things like makeup. It was even advertised for cleaning printer heads and things like that. Um, you buy it in a pack of, well, you get two packs actually, there's a hundred together, 50 in each pack. But this one, I've been using this quite a lot and it's by far my favorite blender at the moment. Uh, not only is it good just for blending out graphite um, from a pencil, but if you tip graphite powder out and you rub that in the graphite powder, you can use it to get some really nice even marks. It's, it's almost like painting with graphite using that. But I'll just show you how well it blends out uh, graphite, graphite pencil. This is 2B pencil lead on all, of, all five of these. I mean look at the lovely smooth evenness of that graphite there look. There's something very special about these. It's, it's like a very microporous sponge on there and you can feel as soon as you put it on the paper it almost grips the paper a little bit. It's not like um, you know a paper blender or anything where it just sort of kind of glides over the paper. You can actually feel this. It's got a slight bite to it when you're using it. And I think that's what's making it so good and why it's really getting a nice, smooth, even, um, you know, blend on this graphite. Really, really good. So that's like the large sponge applicator. And the next one is very similar. It looks very similar, but just smaller. But in fact, it's a slightly different material. This is more like a microfiber cloth. If I try and bring both of them in close, I don't know if you're going to be able to actually see the texture on there. Um, one of them's a sponge and this one is microfiber. Obviously it's not quite so padded as that one. Um, and you can feel the plastic. This one. This is another favourite of mine. This one was recommended to me actually by one of the members over on Patreon. It's called a micro brush. Again, I'll try and get that in focus for you. It's like a, like a sort of microfiber brush type thing on the end there. And again, if you press too hard with it, you will feel the plastic. So the, the best thing to do with these is just to go very lightly. But you're not going to be blending in large areas, obviously, with one of those. You're just looking to use that just to get in the corners of window frames or um, any, any small area on your drawing where you just need to just blend those little tiny hard to get areas, you know, where something like this is going to leave a mark outside of the lines. You want to try and keep it nice and neat. So something like this is absolutely perfect. Works an absolute treat because normally I'd have to use something like the point on a paper blender, which is a lot thicker than one of those, or even a cotton swab. And again, it's a lot thicker than one of those. So that, <laughs> they are ideal for small detail. There's another one that uh, was recommended to me by one of my members over on Patreon. And it's these very small well, they look like tiny, um, if I just get one, tiny cotton swabs. If I just bring that closer so you can kind of see the comparison there. But really, these are quite hard. They're more like um, a paper blender or a tortillion. They're not soft like cotton wool. And they do have quite a sharp point on them, so you can really get in there for the fine detail. But I actually found that point just a little bit too sharp. So what I'd done was... Just tap it several times on your drawing board or the table just to round that off a little bit more. Again, it's not something you're going to be blending out large areas with. You know, you're going to be using this just to get in there for the fine detail. And it really does work well. And again, they come in um, packets. I can't remember how many there are now, but I've got two packets um, together. And for me, these large sponge applicators and these little micro brushes 
tick all the boxes for me. They're really, really good. Really good. And I was kind of thinking about this, um, this Stegler Norris uh, stylus pencil and I thought, well, maybe, you know, because it's a pencil and a blender on the end, that might be a good, good pencil to sort of carry around, um, you know, when you're outdoor sketching or whatever. You know, you've not got to carry separate tools with you. You can kind of carry it all round in one. I mean, the pencil, you know, it's a decent pencil. It's a Stadler. So I'll just quickly show you. I'll just move these out of the way. I'll just quickly show you um, what this is like with graphite powder. Just tip some out on there. I mean, we can just take a little bit. Let's go around in circular motions there. See how lovely and even that blends in. And like I say, you can coat this up with graphite. And actually use it as like a paintbrush or a drawing tool almost. You know, because what's good about it, we're not just using this large flat area. We've got, well, I won't, I won't say a chisel edge like a watercolour brush or anything, but we've got a fine edge along the top there. Plus we've got the corners. And those corners are probably about the same. I'm just looking at it. Probably might be a little bit thicker, but they're probably not far off the same thickness, um, you know, as a paper blending stump, a medium sized paper blending stump. So you can certainly use it on the corner. Just got a little bit of graphite on there. Let's create textures and get finer lines and things like that. I mean, I probably wouldn't use it for a foreground tree like this, but I mean, it will fill an area in quickly, you know, a lot quicker than shading and blending. So I think, you know, as, as a drawing tool in its own right, not just for blending, I think it's an absolute brilliant item. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to get carried away again and start drawing a landscape. Right, stop before you get carried away. You know, you could create nice, well, I've done it actually, nice cloud shadows with this clouds and even sort of distant mountains very quickly just with a graphite powder on that look at that isn't that incredible look just for what 30 seconds distant mountains and now you can start to work on them you know start putting the light Darks, all that kind of stuff in. Right on top of it. Probably get some, you know, smaller details with these if we wanted to. Great for doing distant trees, keeping things nice and soft in the background. Like I say, it's always worth giving these things a try because you might find that they just work a little bit better than what you're used to. These can be used for all sorts of, you know, background techniques, foliage, misty trees, all that kind of thing. You can even use the, uh, the small brush as well. Pick up some graphite on that. Get a nice dark piece there. And again, use that to draw with. That'll create some thin lines. You can even stipple with it to create leaves, soft leaves and things like that. The uses are endless for these things. A little bit of imagination and um, you'll find good use for these. Okay, so um, I'm going to send you guys the links to these. Again, I, it's just something new to try. Those those little fat pads that he was using, the, the number one, um, look like they hold the charcoal or the graphite really well. Um, and they're very consistent with the blending. You're going to see in another one of these little clips um, how oftentimes people will prime the paper with charcoal or graphite first before they begin their drawing. And then in a reductive method, erase and pull areas out and darken areas. But th that little tool to me looks like a really nice, even way to blend the powder or even just to, you know, to draw a little segment and then pull it out and blend it. 
Uh, we saw last week some uh, using the chamois. The chamois held the charcoal and graphite better. You know, some things just kind of knock it off and they don't, when you try to go pull it out, they don't pull very much of the, of the powder out. So it seems like this things that have a little bit more of a grip to them, the spongy applicator or the chamois have a better grip to, to pull the colors around and move them evenly on your paper. This is the, the issue. When you see these absolutely stunning drawings, you think, wow, these people had to have so much patience but they also had to have um, some knowledge on how to use the tools because frustration is the number one um, reason we quit, <laughs> you know, and it, when your paper won't erase. And so we talked about last week, the types of papers that are better to use that are erased more easily. And so all the things that we can do to keep from getting frustrated and wanting to throw the towel in, because it's hard enough as it is, right? Without all these obstacles. So I hope that this has helped helpful to just see some of these different techniques that you might not have tried. Any comments or thoughts about blending tools? Have you used anything like this? I have some makeup sponges. They were too big though. They didn't really, and they were so soft. I couldn't really get in there with any kind of control with them. And I've used makeup applicators, but the sponge is so thin that the plastic piece kind of scrapes the paper. And so that didn't work well. And then makeup sponges disintegrate after a while if you don't use them. They just fall all to pieces. Any thoughts? Anybody have anything you want to jump in there with? All right, I'll move on. You can wave to me if you do, if you can't get yourself unmuted. All right, next segment. Hi, this is Sadie Valeri. And in this video, I'm going to show you how I do really refined graphite shading. And I use this for any time I'm ever rendering anything, but on a cast, it's really the opportunity to do your most refined shading. This is a cast drawing that I've been working on on and off for a couple of years now in my studio, in between teaching my students who are also working on their projects all around me. I have my horse set up under a consistent light source. I have my drawing board set up and I've been going through and rendering and turning form. I'm gonna show you a little bit how I turn form and how I make the graphite look nice and smooth. I'm starting with a 2H pencil here right at the terminator and working up towards the lights. And that's how I draw everything. Um, when I wanna pause right there because this, there's not really very much. This is a little short segment, but she talks about the terminator. Is that a term that any of you are familiar with in drawing? Okay, it was brand new for me. I've never heard that. And then one of the images that I sent you in an email this week had the different parts to the cast shadow, the occlusion, the, the highlight, and, and it also mentioned the terminator. What I understand is the terminator is the hard line right here. Can you see my cursor? Y'all see my cursor? Um, this is the terminator, and this is what she's rounding down here or, or trying to blend. and and smooth it out. So you notice that she sharpened her pencil like we saw last week. Um, Proco, Stan Proco Pinko showed us how to sharpen the, the lead with a, a razor blade like that to get it really nice. Uh, lots of people who draw very detailed use their pencils like this. So that's one key. And you'll also note that she mix, she, she uh, switches between hard and soft pencils and she uses her eraser. But this is very time consuming. <laughs> And so if you're not a detail person, you're probably going to just skim right past this segment. But if you've ever wondered how people get these beautiful transitions on their drawings, and listen, it's like knitting or crocheting for some people. They work on these for months and months. They'll just have them there, you know, sitting by their bedside table or whatever, and they'll just sit and work on shading. And, and I believe it's probably very relaxing to do that. So, you know, don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. I'm sure there's, there's some um, benefit. And if you want to take your drawings to the next level, this would be one of those steps. So, hey, Denise, welcome. You got back from the appointment. I hope I haven't missed wonderful things. Well, I'm recording it, so I'll send that to you later, what we've talked about. I recorded most of it. Oh, look at Norma. She's outside. I know. They're working on the house, so she's Banished. <laughs> so, yes. 
So yes. did she? So is, did she take a just a regular pencil like this and and do that at the end? Yes, a regular it, like one of mm -hmm. these. Yes, and she's going to show. Uh, we sh we looked last. We watched last week. Um, um, him sharpen a piece of charcoal right. that that way, and this is done similarly um, with a probably a little piece of sandpaper and a uh, an exacto ex knife or a one edge right. single edge razor, razor blade. She's going to talk about the kinds of pencils she uses here in just a minute. Oh, okay. It always confuses me what HB is and what. Um, well, see, I can't even think of what the other one is. Uh, H and B. One is hard and one is soft. So I always get confused and then the numbers, but she's gonna show you a little chart on there. The higher the number, if it's a hard pencil, the higher the number, the harder it gets. If it's a soft pencil, the higher the number, the softer it gets. So no wonder it's confusing. But knowing your pencils, knowing your materials, is helpful because she's switching back and forth between hard and soft. Like this big dark area, she used a very soft graphite pencil for that. When she moves to this more refined area, she's using a hard pencil that's not going to deposit so much uh, material on there. So this is only just a couple of minutes. I'll let it play out and then we'll stop it one more time. But you see what she's working on this horse. And I believe she says she's been working on it for a year. Yikes. Whenever I'm shading, whenever I'm turning form, turning form just means making something look round or turned. Uh, form is just a three-dimensional surface. So I'm turning and making the three-dimensional surface look round. I'm using a 2H um, for this particular drawing. The 2H is about a medium hardness of pencil. I'm using much softer pencils, B, mostly B, sometimes 2B over in the shadows. And I'm going all the way up to 8H. This is an 8H pencil. Um, this is a mono brand pencil, which is really, really nice pencil. And I'm not sure that many pencil brands go all the way up to the 8H. And what I usually use is I have one nice soft pencil in my hand if I need to get into the shadows and darken up my terminators. I think I've got a B, but I don't really use the B very much in this video. I'm using the 8H basically to smooth and fill in and make a nice soft transition anywhere I need to make less texture than what I get from my 2H pencil. This way of using the pencils can be applied to any pencil range. And I'm using a, a kneaded eraser twisted into a point to pick out little black dots. And I go back and forth between shading and picking out the black dots quite often. You can use any range of pencil that you want. Um, you can think of this as a soft pencil, a medium pencil, and a hard pencil. When we start off in my classes, I have my students use only 2H, H, and HB. And so you can still think of the pencils the same way, even though I'm using a bigger pencil range. Um, the softest pencils are higher numbers in the B's, so a 2B is much softer than a B. And the harder pencils get harder as the numbers go up, so a 8H is much harder than a 2H. Contrast. If you look at the picture of the horse, you can see that the horse's forehead up by the ears is blindingly white. And then everything else, even the lightest lights, gradate down from that point. So where I'm working over near the bottom of the rib cage, the back of the rib cage, the back of the belly, it's everything is in context and everything is fairly dark. Thank you so much. This is Sadie Valeri, and this has been a little quick video showing you how I turn form and render when I do a cast drawing in graphite. All right, I'm gonna pause it right there for a second. Um, again, with the pencils, uh, HB, is right in the middle. And if you can just think of, let me see if I can go back to her little segment there where she had it um, posted. There we go. Um, H is right in the middle. HB is like a number two pencil that you use in school. It's right in the middle between hard and soft. And then each way it goes either softer towards the B side or harder towards the H side. And that's the only way I can remember it is H for hard. I don't know what the B means. I don't know what it stands for. I think I looked that up sometime, but I didn't retain it. Um, so, you know, when you're looking through your pencils, 
a lot of times we don't know what we're pulling out because we haven't really stopped to really understand how the pencils work. The softer they are, the more the the darker they're going to get. The more the more material they're going to deposit on your paper. Um, any thoughts or comments about anything that she shared? Don't be shy. Okay, we'll move on. Again, th this th she's a very detailed artist. Um, and so not everybody wants to draw that way. I'm not promoting that. I just want to show you lots of different methods for drawing and um, how they get these wonderful transitions. There's one painter that we looked, or one artist we looked at last week, uh, John David Kassan. Kassan. Uh, his, and a few of you posted on the Facebook page this week, um, drawings that are incredibly, they look like a photograph. And if you look at them, you're like, how in the world? I do not, you know, we say automatically, I don't have the patience to do that. I don't even want to do that. And that's fine. But how in the world did they do that? That's the whole last two months of studying the old masters. That's the question we're continually asking. How do they do that? Just so that you know, the more you know about it, the more you can bump your work up to the next level and use some element of what we're looking at with these guys. This next segment, um, Stephen Bowman is being interviewed by Stan Proko. And um, he's going to talk about some different things and very good. And I'm going to use one of his images in the study next week of a portrait. You do not have to do that with me if you want to choose your own. Uh, I know portraits aren't everybody's thing. So if you have something else you can choose for your final project, then you do that by all means. But I will be demonstrating my procedure as I try to, to do the drawing that he's already done. So. All right, and you're welcome to draw right now during this segment too, if you want to. Hey y'all, we've got part two of Stephen Bauman's sketch tour here, where he and I discussed figure drawing techniques, line quality, inspirations, composition, and a bunch more. If you like how Stephen draws and you wanna learn from him, you're in luck because we just released his masterpiece demo on proco.com slash Bauman. In it, he shows you how to draw a fully shaded, realistic portrait in graphite. This is the kind of long demo I'd watch when I was in school. It's really beneficial to see the process start to finish. That's over at proco.com slash bombing. Okay, on to the sketch tour. Line for me is like the kind of underpinning of, uh, I think, really good structural drawing. You know, and I also like, I kind of come from a, a world where drawing is primarily made as a preparation for painting so that you have yeah. uh, useful, efficient drawing techniques that you can use in paint. For me, like it became a whole world in itself. And, and though I, I paint, I probably draw just as much as I paint. And so I- and More, I, right? No? I see you posting a lot more drawings than painting. That's a good point. It's in phases. There's okay. moments, there's oh, moments okay. where like I'll draw for, like when I did this giant life-size drawing that's above me here, that we can see later. Like I was just drawing for about a year at that point, like just all I was working on was drawing projects. Yeah. And then you'll go through a phase where, you know, your expression is a little bit more drawn to oil paint. Mm -hmm. But line quality was something that, that for me, again, I, I found essential. And it was actually a bit after my, my education that I really uh, kind of dove more deeply into it. I just found, you know, I was drawn to it as a kind of way to rationally explain how form appears. How do you suggest your students uh, improve their line quality? Uh, it's about organization. It's about organization and also the amount of pressure that you're able to put on the paper, right? So, and in addition to that, I draw with a ton of different pencils. Um, so I set myself up initially to have like a variance in line quality. We have to think about it like a spectrum, right? You have light lines that are very thin. You have uh, softer light lines. You have dark etched in lines. This is a whole spectrum of line quality here. And each one of these things, like a key on a map, needs to mean something in your drawing. And then you need to use it consistently. So if you're drawing, say, like the ending of a form, right? So this line here is, is meant to really say, the leg is here, it's not here, it stops. This is an ending of form. Right. What I'm trying to communicate with these interior hatch marks is that there is a continuation of form that goes across yeah. the thigh here. If I use the same line quality here and here, right. 
I would create a really uh, uh, a kind of strong visual dissonance that would be very confusing and difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so organizing line quality is, is all about being kind of consistent in how you're doing it and also assigning like a purpose to your line quality, right? If I'm drawing like a shadow edge, right? I want that shadow edge to appear different from like a form ending edge. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing here. But again, I just have to be consistent throughout. In the same way that like shadow shapes actually need to look different from halftone shapes. If I treated these halftone shapes with the same kind of edges that I'm treating the shadow shape, I would again be creating a kind of visual dissonance. Yeah. Right? Um, it would be very hard to kind of work with and organize. Okay, so in learning line quality, they have to learn edge. Uh, edges are a form of that, yeah, yeah. for sure. Or at least it, it dovetails into it in the sense that maybe when you're fully getting on into values, you would say edges are more about the meetings of values. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, let's be honest, there's a linear idea in yeah. that as well. The lines. Okay, they're, they're really, um, they really get into some detail about drawing, and I, I don't want you to feel um, overwhelmed about that. But I, I did really pick up on, I'm going to let it play out, but I did pick up on line quality and assigning a purpose. You know, if you're drawing a shadow, a shadow is very different than the edge of an object. So you want to you want to remember where you are. I think that's really important with drawing. That we start most of the time we start with a line. We start with an outline, and and when you do that, it's really hard. So it's it's difficult sometimes to make it soft enough to appear like a shadow. And that's one of the things I correct a lot in class. Is shadows oftentimes look too hard. They look like another object. And so you always have to be mindful of where you are in the drawing. Are you like he showed on that leg? you know, the lines you make on the interior part of the leg are defining the muscles and the shadows around the muscles. They shouldn't be hard edges. So I really liked that little illustration of the different types of line quality. That'd be a great exercise for you to just sit there and work on different types of lines, really hard lines, really soft, fuzzy lines, really big areas of shading. And just think about the intensities and what you can get with your different pencils how dark you can go with your pencils and just practice it on what he calls line quality using a variety of these pencils that we just looked at. Um, and he said, again, they're like keys on a map to be very um, consistent with those and, and careful with your lines. Uh, I, I have an exercise that I have you guys do sometimes that I, I don't want you to make any lines on your drawing. I want it to be all shading it's the side of your pencil no lines and that's a great exercise to get you out of the coloring book mentality of always making things you know hard and sharp and flat um, and then there's times when we just want to use lines we don't want to use any shading you want to try to use cross hatching and you're going to see a little bit of an example of that here any comment about this so far is it sounding like mumbo jumbo to you or is it is it resonating is it it's extremely your interesting good it out. Good. You can watch this whole video and he has, Proko is probably one of my favorite instructors on YouTube. He is a YouTube millionaire um, and he has wonderful videos. So if you want to go and just sit and watch, it's Proko TV on YouTube. Stan Proko Pinko is his name and he's funny and cute too. So that helps. You put down are representing the edges of those values. Right? Uh, at times, yeah. I mean, this, this I would say is like more of like, I'm actually just studying the beginnings and endings of forms. Yeah. More so than assigning like, a, I mean, the, where's the light coming into this? Could be coming in anywhere. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Okay, yeah. So they're not really assigned to that. Like, this is a very bright plane on the thigh, but I'm looking at the endings of forms. Mm -hmm. Now, the cool thing about this is that you could tell me that the light source is here. You could tell me that it's here. You could tell me that it's here. And I could draw a set of shadow shapes that would that would work with that assignment of like light direction right just based on the knowledge of form that you have because we've all seen like these little spheres right yeah um, they're fantastic as a metaphor to kind of explain the understanding of form right we all understand in our minds what a sphere is yeah. what the shape of it is it's very consistent so if i told you stan who's an expert or or, or brandon maybe who's a novice I assume. Artist. <laughs> if I tell you, Stan, that the light source on this sphere is coming in at a direction upper right hand, like almost behind the form, 
you'd be able to draw me uh, a very convincing set of shadow edges and values that would create a modeling to that form. I would, yeah. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And if I told you the light source was from a completely different direction, yeah. you'd also be able to model that form because you understand fundamentally and completely what a sphere is shaped like. Now, when we get to like a much more complex set of forms like the thigh, mm -hmm. where we have a dozen different forms interacting, our relative knowledge or lack of knowledge about the nature uh, and, and the kind of complete sense of those forms will dictate how well we're able to assign shadow edges to them. Right. And so for me, line was a way to fully understand what the beginnings and endings of those forms were so that when I did apply light and shadow to it, which eventually is the goal, I could be really eloquent and make sure that I was describing exactly what was there instead of, um, you know, take the alternative that, that this is just an empty outline and I just draw a shadow edge through it. Mm -hmm. uh, my incidence of inaccuracy there is going to be much higher than if I totally understand and have explored the forms inside of it. it. And this is the kind of thing that I thought when I first started drawing, like, that, come on, that's got to be too much work, right? That's got to be way too much. I can't do that much work. I'll never get anything done in my life. Well, as it turns out, you get a lot better at drawing. These things happen a lot faster. Representation. The sketchbooks were, were more about ideas and evolving ideas, more so than evolving sort of technical uh, or technical evolution. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, again, that's, I understand that's just kind of a personal thing. That was like my take on, on sketching. Do you have any sketchbooks here? Uh, do I have any sketchbooks here? Yeah. Can I see one? Oh God, they're horrible. <laughs> like these are, are little sketched ideas. Okay. None of them are. Yeah. Interesting okay. So this is about. developing just thoughts. You've yeah. got a lot of words. You're just kind of quickly throwing down an idea and this, has absolutely nothing to do with rendering form. Yeah. It's, it's purely... It's like, purely just, I had this thumbnail. thought, yeah, like I want to I wanna evolve it a tiny bit. Great, yeah. great hand on this one, by the way. <laughs> um, I knew it was a hand. You know, and some of them... got the point across. <laughs> some of them will get even a little bit more detail where I actually start kind of planning out a painting. Oh, like cool. thinking about like where I'm going to have different value zones and different kind of color zones. I mean, this is a painting I never even made, like... Mm. I, I might make it one day. Like I usually have kind of ideas years and years before, before I really kind of create the, the big narrative work. Yeah. Like a, a portrait, of course, is a portrait. And, and you can, yeah. with enough experience, you can draw a lot out of it just with an immediate reaction. But if you're trying to get something that, that is evocative in a much larger way, you know, it's involving textures and colors and different things. For me, those ideas like take a long, long time to evolve. Yeah. Uh, like the painting that, that, you know, if you're listening or watching this, the painting you probably already know of mine, uh, the girl with her glowing finger. But, uh, but that idea I had for like four years before the history. actual painting, <laughs> before the actual painting happened, now representative that... of, of a really fascinating idea to me. And it's how you can be really sculptural with, with hatching. Yeah. Um, it's more like you, you think of like these old tiny etchings, like the kinds that we have on dollar bills. There's two like French drawing programs that like I'm aware of from the 19th century. One is made by Charles Barg um, that we use at the Academy today. And it's very sort of shadow and light based. Um, there's one before that. And I'm not sure the artist who did it, but it was very much made in this sort of like uh, cross hatching, like or very ornate cross-hatching sort of mm. form-based drawing. Yeah. And it's a whole drawing course, just like Charles Barg's, but with a totally different focus. Um, and the focus is more on, on how to show form through hatching. I think it's really yeah. fascinating. This is something I'd probably, I consider maybe a very loose sketch. Um, we went to an open drawing evening with uh, a few friends in, in, in Brooklyn and uh, we just had a model there and, you know, we're just sitting, sketching on our laps and like having a glass of wine and stuff. No, oh, just nothing. Just kind of parted really this one out. Squiggly, you know. Yeah. Um, That's why it's so. Yeah, well, the, the threshold gets raised, you know, yeah, over the years. Yeah. I would have loved, you know, twelve years ago, I'd have gone, man, the best thing I've ever drawn. Yeah. Um, this is very fetching. The hair. This, this like. I had a huge influence from fetching. In fact, I would say that probably before, before my third drawing education, I think I was really influenced by fetching. I really loved just the aesthetic. I mean, you could just get a sense that he was like. Painting with that chaotic brush, you'd say that this is painted with a chaotic brush. You know, I took the side of the pencil and just scraped it over to create a kind of diffused atmosphere that you kind of draw lines through. Right. Like you're kind of the mood board of your, of your work, in a way. 
Another, another sketch I did during anatomy class, um, just kind of focused on hatching and structure and mm -hmm. trying to, to not so much refine things, but to just kind of follow forms around. And eventually, you know, the thing is, like, if you just did this, if I did this over like 10 times, you know, like spent, you know, 10 hour long sessions or whatever with a model, you could get to a really refined place with it. It's not that this has like a low ceiling of refinement, like a rougher technique. I mean, but again, it's just, it would be highly kind of laborious to go through drawings that way. You know what I like? Yeah, Tom. Then, well, this kind of sounds stupid. It's like, you know what I like about this is these dirty spots. <laughs> but no, th this is a completely random mm. thought. Mm. When I am drawing yeah. and I see some of this starting to happen, yeah. I immediately just take the eraser and start, start cleaning it up. Yeah. You left it all in. Yeah, I kind of like Show it. Show me the really. secret. No, how you know, how do I not be it started, pissed off about that? It started because I would like pre-tone my canvas with, or my paper with graphite. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed, of course, is that you have a kind of certain chaotic or uneven element to it. But then I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting, you know, brush, so to speak, in its own way. Yeah. Like that little bit of chaos. And so I started then, like even when I would draw on like white paper, I used to actually, I used to draw wearing a glove. And I had like this really this. nice, no, 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 like oh, okay. not to prevent it, but just like I would rub stuff on my fingers and stuff. And I just, I know you don't want oil on it. So I just use a glove to do it. I don't uh, do that much uh, anymore. Okay. So. And then this one is, is actually the exception in all these. All these are in graphite. This is a drawing done in, in charcoal. Mm -hmm. I was using um, General's charcoal pencils and um, pre-toned this with, with charcoal powder as well. Yeah, I think charcoal is great. It's a really direct medium. Also, some of the line quality that you get, like that Fetchin-esque line quality, is, I think is really difficult to capture in graphite, mostly because um, graphite kind of sticks into the paper a lot more. A lot of these lines I can still craft and sculpt and hone. Mm. If I did that in graphite, it'd be pretty well in the paper. Yeah, you could still take your thumb through that and, and, exactly. and get rid of that texture if you wanted to. One. But like, oh, man, this is cool. Yeah, this is an exercise uh, I, can't, I cannot recommend enough. This was in class for a yeah, student demo? This is, uh, yeah, I was doing workshops out in Long Island. And so we had this model um, and I'd set her up and then I'd put like a sculpture stand next to her mm -hmm. so that the skull is in as close to the exact same lighting as you can get yeah. the, the portrait in, right? Um, and then we draw her while she was up and, and models will work on like maybe 20, 25 minute sessions, right? And then they need to get down and like stretch the bones and stuff. And then we, we draw the skull during that time. So it was a really kind of intensive like workshop, no breaks, you know, you're just drawing the whole time. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. Sorry, that was pretty, uh, that was the longest little segment. But um, I, I found he's very academic, very detailed, uh, but he, uh, his drawings were some of my favorites. Um, he's really, really good at what he does. And so I was interested to see some of the different techniques. And, and I, I thought it was especially interesting to think about uh, shading with hatching, versus just shading with um, form and, and, sh and shadow light, you know, no, no lines. And so there's whole courses on that, on, on one, one or both. And so, you know, again, we're just going to a different, a deeper level with our drawing. And um, I hope that any, any thoughts or comments on anything you saw from Stephen Bauman? I want to ask a question. Sure. So the background uh, of some of his drawings, that was with graphite. Um, was that like, you know how we put the background on first when we're painting? Is that what that was? Yes. And, and he, he would draw on it on top of it? or Yes. He mentioned that he would tone his paper first. And that's a pretty common thing that you see. Um, we Last week we watched as they used the charcoal powder and toned the whole canvas with just powder in a brush or powder in a sponge applicator, and then uh, squirted alcohol or acetone or, or um, Gamsol or something on there to give it some sort of some texture. Well, there's many artists who will just tone that with, with powdered charcoal or, you know, you can also just take vine charcoal and make yourself a big pile of it on another piece of paper and then take a blending tool and apply it that way. So. Um, it's easier to use the, the powder to put that all over. You, however, want to test your paper and make sure that you can erase, that it's not some cheap paper that's not going to erase for you and you're going to get really frustrated with it. Well, um, can you, that, when, when you put the, when you tone it, do you put, what makes it stay? You know, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm thinking paint wise, but like acrylic or something, but if you're drawing on it, won't it make spots or do you spray it with something to keep it? 
I there. don't spray, um, and, and I didn't right. really address that in any of these videos. I don't spray because you're putting a liquid onto your drawing or your pastel, so I don't usually typically use sprays. Um, you're, the, the graphite is much harder to erase than charcoal. Oh, okay. So it's going to stay without a problem. Okay. The charcoal, once you blend it in and push it, it's going to stick on the paper. Now, any kind of a charcoal drawing, you're going to want to put uh, some wax paper or vellum over it to keep it from smearing because charcoal is much softer material than graphite. So it will blend, it will smear easily. Um, and again, test your paper. The papers that I told you about last week are going to be better quality paper. It's just like a painter who will make sure they use a lead prime canvas or some really nice quality canvas to paint on. There's a reason for that. It lifts easier. Um, it, it's like a cheap canvas. When you go to paint on, it's going to suck all the color and stain it, and it's not going to move around. Whereas if you're using a nice paper that will lift easily and erase easily and has a nice texture that's not going to get damaged easily. Um, you know, it, it, your materials make all the difference in the world. Right. So if you're just grabbing copy paper and a HB pencil, you know, a, a number two pencil, you can only do certain thing with that. So okay. what else? Any other thoughts? And again, I know there is time for you to draw today, but mostly that is, on your own you're you're just using these techniques and i invite you to send me a text a picture or an email with your drawings later on today if you want to get some critique and feedback um also if you, you know we'll have the last 30 minutes or so to start working on the basic shapes of class i've only got about 10 minutes of this left so um you can start drawing if you've already started drawing you don't want all this academic stuff i totally understand because everybody's different with their personality and their their goals for for today any other thoughts about this segment um he talked about painting with a chaotic brush and how some drawings are sort of like that they're drawn with a little bit of chaos and a little bit of organization and that's an interesting contrast that you see in some of these drawings that that we like so um, again just exposing yourself to different techniques different types of art and not just staying re, you know confined to one particular way of working any questions okay this last segment i believe it's the last one is by tom lynch he is a painter and this is a whole long video that i just grabbed some clips from on how to use the sketch and wash pencil by general it's a cheap little pencil i got one at the last art conference that I went to. It's about two, two bucks. You can probably get them at Hobby Lobby. And uh, it's just a fun little demonstration. So I think you'll enjoy this. This is, you might say this is more like painting. Um, well, there's actually two. There's, there's the charcoal, the liquid charcoal and the um, sketch and wash pencil. So I think you'll enjoy these, but these are drawings. So. Hi, I'm Tom Lynch on location, but this little gizmo, this little sketch and wash pencil is really unique in that I can take and add a little touch of water with a brush and it's like a watercolor pencil. It just releases all its shading, black and white shading. The uh, same scene that I've done a little sketch in two different ways. And that's one of the things I like about the sketch and wash pencil. It kind of encourages me to play a little bit. I mean, each of these had <laughs> take but a few minutes, and I had a chance to look at maybe the light tree in front of a dark background or dark tree in front of a light background here and reverse the fence and the fields and buildings and so forth. So I had a chance to just play and explore, and this was all done with the two things, the sketch and wash pencil and a brush. But here then comes, you know, the fun part is where I'll do some shading with this pencil. And that shading, as you uh, have seen here, that shading is going to turn into paint, more or less. So it's going to dissolve with that water. Little area where I'll shade it especially dark. And I'll use a couple of these especially dark sections as a reservoir. It's like my palette holding some paint that I can, you know, transfer over to the tree or whatever to. Like I said, you can just take a, uh, a regular brush 
and I take the sponge sometimes so I can roll the brush and get a point or just come right from my little uh, container of, uh, of uh, water and put that so now you can see I've got everything in view and so now I'm going to just take and look at how there it is all that area that I had done the shading with the pencil is turning this into paint and watch this I'll take some of this pick up this paint and I'll do some shading to the tree I'll transfer some of this dissolved pencil graphite paint call it what you want it's all dissolved and now I'll use that as an area to transfer over here where I might want a middle value or a lighter value I may not be able to travel you know with my brush all the time or have it but this I can anywhere and I can open it up and put clear water in there you can also put water with color that's another lesson and give a little squeeze and it transfers and now that water that's here is moved its way up to the brush portion of this so another little fun little product here you know just using what is there now here's another little trick that I'll take and do I'll take now and I'm just squeezing out water and squeezing it on the white surface I didn't do any that's that's normal pencil there so since this is already wet I have just a little light touch and if I'd like to have these long little spiky you know pieces of grass so I can now just use this and it will dissolve it right when I touch the wet surface maybe just a few accents some little wild flowers or a weed or two there so there's another possibility where you wet it first and then there's times like in here let's just leave it as a, a a tool of drawing and let the pencil look like just a regular pencil mark where I have all these little stone parts little highlights of darks because I get a beautiful beautiful ebony dark tool this sketch and wash you can see how all I need is the sketch and wash pencil I need a brush I can wet it and come back like this and darken it even more if I want to punch up that dark so put a little moisture there to begin with come back in and take your sketch and wash pencil and smooth it out again had before and I had a chance to explore uh, all with just having my sketch and wash a little bit of, uh, of water maybe a sponge from Joe's and uh, any brush will take and dissolve this for you. So now you can. Okay, I want to pause it. Right this... um, I loved, I love this sketch and wash for this simple, um, this simple ex ex example of doing a quick, uh, rough draft of your piece, and how look at if you'll look at this a little closer. I had to make myself really stop and look at it. Um, you can see that he did some different things here. One, he makes the tree dark. Um, he makes the, under the tunnel there, light. And the other is the, just the opposite. So he just played around with his values and in the exact same scene, he tried some different things quickly with that sketch and wash, which we talked about a few months ago when we did our sketchbook fun um using doing quick rough drafts and i encourage you before you start a big project or painting to do three different drawings of it three different renderings at least try some different things because we just we jump right in we don't really think of possibilities and i loved I, do you have any comment about these two is there one that you like better that you think reads better Yeah, Denise. Of course, I'm always impressed by the darkest darks against the lightest lights. And I just think that translates into a, a really nice piece, whether it's graphite, paint, pastel, anything. And But you can learn those values in a safe place with your pencil. Mm -hmm. And they translate into your paint. Absolutely. So it is definitely applicable to all of us, regardless of what medium we prefer using. Yeah, and it's a quick way to, you know, just get that little bit of water and spread it really fast 
it's a quick way to examine your values and see what works well. Because if your values and your drawing and your composition are strong, you have a much better chance when you start slapping paint on there. Um, you, you know, and I, I mentioned this a lot, but one of the things I learned from Gail LeVay, who's a local teacher here, is that she makes a plan ahead of time for what's, what her values are gonna, the distribution of values and what works really well on the values. And I, you know, I think that the little tunnel works better with a dark uh, interior. Um, you know, I can see, I don't like this big dark area to the left of the, of the bridge. I think that's uh, really too dark right there in the middle of the page. So you can see really quickly the, the distribution of how things read um, and make some decisions uh, on, the, on the front end. Uh, so anyway, I, I thought this was a great little tool. I've never used, I bought, I have three or four of them in my box and I've never used it. Anybody else ever used it before? The sketch and wash pencil pe peach? Yes, and they're cheap and they're fun. They're fun, yeah. It's like a toy. <laughs> it is, it is. One word of caution. Oh. Go ahead, somebody else. I was just gonna say I have all different colors and, and I use them when I'm doing watercolor sometimes. And I use crayons too, water soluble crayons. Water soluble, water soluble. A word of caution, and in, in, I found this little thing. It says erasing with water soluble graphite can be difficult. So you cannot erase the material after you've added water to it with a traditional eraser, like an ink wash. Instead, erasing needs to be done in the same manner as lifting watercolor. You add water to a paper towel or a Q-tip, dilute the area that you want thinned, um, and you should not expect to be able to totally remove it once you've wet it. So again, it's a good idea to approach a drawing loosely when you're making marks with the graphite lightly loosely carefully you can get tired with the drawing as you add more water and you're more confident of where you're going if you're going to do some kind of beautiful drawing it's like watercolor you're gonna you can mess yourself up and you can't erase it so you'll you know just bear that in mind that that's how you erase the same with the charcoal that you're going to see in this next little short segment uh there's five minutes left and i'm going to show you a quick uh demonstration on Hold on, somebody's got noise. Okay, a quick demonstration on how to use liquid charcoal. And you can buy that in a tube now. You can also um, just take regular charcoal powder and add water to it. I haven't tried that, but I think you can do that. <laughs> I'm saying that with a tongue in cheek there because I'm not 100% sure. All right. Where that noise is coming from, let's see. Santos, today I have a surprise. I received Nitrum Charcoal's new product, Liquid Charcoal. Yes, you heard right, Liquid Charcoal, and I'm gonna paint with it today, or draw, or paint. I have been using Nitram Charcoal since I was introduced to them at the Angel Academy when I was studying in Florence. They were using it because it's a really high quality of charcoal, it's constant in temperature, and also they come in different grades. You have the H, the hardest one, uh, this is the B, which is the softest one, and then you have in the middle HB, and you can sharpen them really sharp to get those minute details in place. And they also have an assortment box with the different varieties of charcoal and my drawing of Janina is in the back. I have a video talking about Nitron charcoal, you can click here if you want to watch that. But today I want to talk about the liquid charcoal which I just got. It has a consistency of oil paint but it's, you can dilute it in water and the more water you use the, trans the more transparent it gets. So if you want a lighter you add more water, if you want the pure black you just can apply it straight out of the tube. My tendency as an artist is to look for the naturalism as we see it and react to it in nature. But the way I build my work can be very abstract at the beginning since I don't know how much control I can have with this liquid charcoal. I'm thinking of using it almost as if it was to paint. So the beginning stage is when I'm gonna use most of this liquid charcoal. The advantage of this will be for me to mass in larger areas without having to 
draw it by hand with a stick. I did a little bit of research and found out that every artist that has used liquid charcoal, even though it's a new product, every artist is using it in a different way. So just the way I'm gonna do it is my way. This is basically a watercolor. The binder is gum arabic and the pigment is charcoal, which matches perfectly the temperature of my charcoal sticks. I'll be drawing on this Fabriano paper. It's 300 grams, hot press, it's very thick and I just pinned it here to my carpeted wall. I start with the construct stage, measuring and separating lights from shadows. I'm using a B charcoal stick because it's the softest one. In case I make a mistake, it will be easy to erase. Then I put a bit of the liquid charcoal in the corner of my plate, add some water on the other end and keep it tilted so that way I can control how much water I mix with the charcoal. I apply a light wash, adding more medium as I need it. But my end goal is to leave it lighter than what it needs to be so that I can spend time drawing and adjusting all these values. Okay, now you see he switched here. He just uses the, he does a quick line drawing with, a, with fine charcoal and for placement. And then he gets a brush and he masses all these big blocked in areas. This would be the same as if we were doing a painting, we were just blocking everything in lightly. Now he switched to charcoal in a, um, a charcoal holder. And I have one of those, it's, it's like a, a clutch pencil almost, it'll clutch your charcoal, you can sharpen it. And so he's, re, he's refining more and more. And I've just sped up this next segment because it's, it's a little bit long, just so you can see how he develops this. I know that's really fast, guys, but um, you can watch this on your own too. It, it sped up with him and I sped it up even more, but he's just using a sharpened piece of char vine charcoal now, which the, the beauty of the vine charcoal is it's so dark. It's so soft and so dark that you can get those really rich, darkest darks on there. Just about done here. Uh, I don't know why I have that on there. So I'm going to let that play on out. That was last, uh, last week we talked about using alcohol with your pastel or with your charcoal and um, the difference in, in some cautions. To, and I sent that, I believe, in, if I didn't, I'll send it in this week's so that you want to be careful um, and how to use the, the difference in the denatured and rubbing alcohol and other things that people will use to melt their uh, materials. So that is the segments in drawing. I'm sorry it was a little bit long, but I hope it's helpful to you. It's lots of little different techniques that I don't know that we take the time to go and search and watch all these long videos trying to find these little tiny snippets that are helpful to you. Um, any thoughts or questions about the liquid charcoal? Oh. There's Teresa, she's been drawing. 
you can, it, it, then this next segment will be um, drawing the basic shapes. And if you want to send me, I encourage Grace to, um, sorry, I'll find it here in a minute. I'm not multitasking so well today. I encourage Grace to post on Facebook um, you, you, what you're playing around with. You don't have to, but if you want to, um, to post those and put the techniques that you're trying. Uh, let us know how they work for you and if you liked them, because that's the whole purpose of this this month is to learn some new techniques, to share what works for you and what doesn't work. Again, to push yourself to go to the next um, level with your artwork. Um, this is probably my favorite illustration and I'm gonna leave it up. This is by James Gurney and he had a couple of great pieces here. Let me find the other one to show you real quick. Any of these items will be good to, uh, hold on, we got some noise going on here. Where's that coming from? Probably me or my dog snoring. Oh, okay. Yeah, just mute if you've got a lot of back, background noise. It's okay. Um, so let me show you this other James Gurney one really quick. And here's another great example. This is something that Gail LeVay does in her classes too. This is a white bag, a white paper bag. And it's a great, great exercise to practice your drawing and your values in. And to and Bridget bought me some of these. I have them in the studio. It's also great to, to put different color paper under the white bag or behind the white bag. And, um, and then just draw what you see because you're going to see if you put um, orange and this is going into something else but if you put orange paper under this bag you're going to see blue shadows if you put yellow paper you're going to see purple shadows and you're going to go where is that purple coming from there is no purple there but it's a very interesting study to do uh, for for values and and transitions uh, let me see if I can find that gurney piece I have a lot of information on here I'm not going to overwhelm you with but basically just bump up your drawing to the next level. Um, is, this, is this on your, um, on the, um, the Facebook or something too, to look, are you sending this to? Uh, I'm recording this session and I will send you, uh, I'm sending you links to everything that's been mentioned today. Okay. Um, I, I've already sent these pictures to you. Right. Gotcha. That was of the basic shapes. Um, the drawing by Gurney, I guess maybe it's, I'll find it in a minute. I'll send you that one too, but here it is. This is um, a, a pencil and watercolor wash. This could be easily done with the sketch and wash pencil. And I thought this is a great little study too to do. If you find James Gurney, I'll send the link to his Instagram or his, he has a website. He is a fabulous teacher and a fabulous, he gives you lots of great examples of things. So you could find some really fun things to study with him. Um, and uh, I wanted to say on doing basic shapes, um, there are a couple of tips that I have. It's funny that it's very difficult for some, it's very difficult sometimes for all of us to draw a cube. Um, and I don't, it's just weird that I'll go around and people will try to draw a cube and they'll have these, um, these parallel parts will be all wonky. And so I want to give you a quick tip on the cube. And I, I wish I'd made a video for this because I do it in class often. But um, there are three sets of parallel lines on a cube. And there's a couple different ways that people do it. Sometimes they'll draw a box to start with and then they'll finish off the cube. Uh, and that's what I'll do sometimes. If I'm seeing the cube straight on, I'll draw this first box, which is e all four lines are equal in length. And then here's the three sets. Can you see my cursor? Okay, so you have this line, this line, and this line. Are th all, those three lines are parallel like railroad tracks. They should be equally spaced. Then you have the other three, which are vertical. They will always be vertical. If they're not vertical, your cube will be sitting cockeyed. So make sure to check yourself, make sure that the vertical lines are all, if you're building, if you're doing a house or a barn, 
and you get those lines not straight, it, you're, it's like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Those three sets of vertical lines must be parallel and must be straight. And the others, just think about the hands of the clock. Uh, this one right here is not horizontal. It's going a little bit raised to maybe, um, I don't know, to maybe 245 on the clock if you were looking at clock hands. So, so you just think of those three sets of parallel, parallel lines when you're making the cube. Um, the, cu uh, the cylinder is a series of elliptical shapes. And I have um, a quick way of making an accurate cylinder. And that is to measure with my pencil. I know you guys hate measuring. It is to measure this top section that you can see, the top of the cube, and then decide how many of those could I fit in the body of the cube. And I didn't measure this one, but I'm gonna guess, I'll take my pencil and I'll hold it, one, including the top of the cube, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those elliptical shapes will fit in the body of that cube. That's one way to do it. If you were doing a little coffee cup, um, you would measure the elliptical circle of the opening of the cup and then see how many of those would fit in the cup. That's a relative way of measuring. And that's a good way to check yourself to see. Because most of the time you get that elliptical shape on the top too big. And it's open too much. And so that we know when we're using an elliptical shape, when you, um, when you, change your eye level, it gets more, here's a, a good example of a coffee cup. So if we were over that coffee cup and looking straight down into the coffee cup, it would be a perfect circle. But the more you come down on your eye level, the more that circle gets squashed. And so when you set up a, a coffee cup or a teacup to paint, I like to have it about down here at 20 degrees because I don't want to be looking down in the cup but I do want to see enough at the top of the cup that gives me a dimensional quality to my drawing. If, you, if you're looking at it eye level and you can't see any of the top of the cup, it's not going to look very dimensional. It's going to look flat. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so the, so the elliptical shape is the key with the cylinder. And then a sphere, I usually just get my hand going in centrifugal motion. And I'm, I do a very, very lightly, I don't even let it hit the paper until I get my, my rhythm going. And then I do a quick sphere. And then I decide how big I want that sphere to do. And then of course the shadow, depending on your light source, is gonna be squashed. So it's gonna be, remember when you put your shadow in and you can look at that sphere when you're looking at the example. Let me look up here, give you a quick example. Um, okay, so for this sphere, the shadow comes about a third of the way of the ball is where the shadow lands. So if you come up here and you start putting the shadow way up here, you're gonna alter your light source. Your light source is coming from the upper right and the shadow's dropping down here about a third of the way. And you can measure that with your pencil and see maybe it's a fourth of the way. Yeah, it's more like a fourth of the way or three quarters of the way down the ball or a fourth of the way up the ball. So just, you know, check yourself, compare your, compare it to different things. Be careful with the shadows. Notice, this is a great example. Notice how the shadow is darkest right next to the object. It gets lighter and softer as it moves away from the object. Try not to make your shadows on your basic shapes all one value they will vary in intensity. So have them get softer as they move away and lighter as they move away from the, the body. Also, you know, get familiar. Like, like uh, he said, like Stephen Bauman said, if, you're, if you've done a sphere 10 times, you're getting knowledgeable about how light hits a round object. So somebody could tell you, well, the light's coming from the left and you've done enough spheres that you know how to shade that already because you've done it. So make yourself familiar with these forms. Do them over and over. It will only make your work get better. Somebody have a question? Jump in there. 
<laughs> okay, no worries. All right. Um, any questions about doing the basic shapes? <clears throat> here is um, here is James Gurney, and you guys can be drawing as well if you want to. You know, I'm going to talk, um, and I apologize. Some of you new folks, Carol and. Catherine, I apologize for talking so much, but my students always say, no, that's what we're here for. We want to learn. And some of the hardest teachers I've studied with <clears throat> have been demonstrators that don't talk and I fall asleep. And so I need interaction and I, I've figured out ways to explain things. So I do talk a lot, but listen, this is a great, this would be a great image for you to draw and label because it's teaching you about the cast shadow, which is the one the object throws, the body shadow, and does it say that? It doesn't really say the body shadow, but it, it's breaking it apart. But the body shadow is the one that's on the object. The terminator is the hard edge right here where the shadow breaks. The half tone is really the medium tone, that some people call it half tone, but it's the medium middle tone of, of value of light. Um, the occlusion shadow is occluded down here under the object that you can't hardly see it and it's on the it's not on the object it's on the surface and then the core of the shadow is probably the darkest part of the shadow so these are the the reflected light or reflect refracted light if the object is transparent but reflected light is what's bouncing up off the table so the more if you draw this and then you label it you're going to um, you're going to press that into your mind and make it more tangible for you the next time you shade something. Um, I can't tell you how important it is to do this. I, I'm going to do it myself because again, it presses it in and makes it, um, it makes it work better for me on the next thing that I draw. So I'll leave this one up. It's probably uh, for a sphere. If you want to do one of the others that I've sent you, that's fine as well. Uh, also, Sadie that did the horse, she talked about identifying the lightest light and the darkest dark. If you'll do that at the beginning of any project, if you'll even make yourself a note, okay, I, the lightest light is up here where the highlight is. Nothing else will be that light. Um, of course, the table is pretty darn light. So it, the lightest light could be here, could be, it's, it's not on the ball, it's on the table right here. Uh, on this particular, this is a gray ball, so it's a little different than a white ball. Uh, so it, identifying those things right from the beginning and making sure that everything else falls in between those two extremes um, is a real good way to have a more accurate drawing. And then use whatever uh, blending tools you have. I challenge you to try something different. Um, if you have the wrapped torti tortillons or tortillions, some people call them, uh, he suggested that you tap them to knock that point off because the point can damage your paper and be kind of aggravating. I don't like the wrapped ones as much because they don't blend as smoothly. Um, if you have a Q-tip, if you have a, a chamois cloth or a, a Viva or brownie paper towel that's nice and soft, be sure to fold it so you don't have any hard edges. That's what the paper stump, the uh, paper tort Tillian does sometimes, those hard edges don't give you a nice smooth blend. Um, if you want to make a pile on another little index card or something that you can use to blend with, to dip into and blend with, if you want to get some nice smooth shadows. Any thoughts or questions, or if you want to send me, I'm going to turn my phone up. So if I get a text here, if you want to send me um, your drawings, and I know you're just getting started on them, so no pressure. This is the tricky part, Catherine, um, for me. <laughs> I know Catherine's an instructor as well, and I know that... Um, Drawing together, I've tried to figure different ways to do that. Um, for me to draw, my little window right now is so small that you really can't see it well. And there are some people who are on phones, so you really can't see what I'm doing too well. Um, what I do is after the class is over, I post this video that I made. 
um, and everybody has access to go back and watch that again. Um, I do have people turn their camera sometimes so that I can see what they're working on. It's hard because sometimes your lighting's bad, sometimes your camera's not good, um, and I don't feel like I give you a good critique that way. So I prefer that they text me their picture and or email it. And if you, I can't get to email right now, but I could get to your text. Um, or I could get to my email on my phone, but it's just easier by text during the class and then by email later because I like to send back, um, I take your artwork and your original that you're looking at and I put them in Photoshop side by side and then I send you back a bullet point critique of your work. Um, and I, I've decided to do that on Fridays. If, if I can today, I'll, I'll do it. But what happened was I got a text here and an email there and somebody sent me something on Facebook and I, I was having a hard time going back and gathering all those to try to critique them you know, at different times. So I decided that Friday would be my critique day. If you need it right away and you're working on a big project, you can tell me, hey, I'm working on this. Could you answer this for me really quick? Um, and also, if you post, this is to everybody, if you post on Facebook and you want critique, or if you send it to me, most of the time I'm assuming if you're sending it to me, you want critique. But if you post it on Facebook, let me know if you want critique or if you just want to share it with everybody, because I certainly don't want to jump in there and give you critique if you're done with it and you don't, that's not what you're after. So um, that helps me to know if you would like input. I had a student years ago, a professor, and uh, he was, I, I loved him, uh, Jordan. Some of y'all might remember him, Norm. I don't know if you remember Jordan, but he would bring me pieces that were done and he would tell me that. He'd say, this is done. I'm not gonna work on it anymore. I'm not gonna change it. Whatever you tell me, I'm not gonna change it. But I do wanna know for my next piece. And I loved that uh, clarity and that, you know, the way he was just really, um, forthcoming with and direct with how his critique. Uh, so it helps me to know what your goals are. If you want to, if you're still working on it, you want it, you want some input. Um, so, so I do give some time while you're on here to get everybody started because here's the other thing that we're finding with these classes. Um, most of us will not set aside time to do this if we don't have accountability. And so that's another thing that this two and a half hours on Tuesdays does. My goal is to give you inspiration, to give you some instruction, and then to give you time to get started so that you're, you've got it all out. And I love it. I'd love to hear if you took the whole day to work on art. I'd love that. That's like my dream that I never get to do myself. Um, so, what it, however that works for you, at least I'm getting you started. We're obviously not going to stay on here till everybody finishes their drawing. Um, but I do, I do love seeing what you're working on and, and having this accountable um, avenue of, of artwork. Um, Lana just sent me her apple. I think it was Lana. Yeah. Beautiful Lana. So here's a thing, here's a little tid, tidbit that I didn't mention today. If you're using a toned paper, which is either a, a beige paper or a brown paper or a gray paper, whatever, that makes it easier because all the middle tone is taken care of for you. Um, then you'll just wanna use your pencil or your charcoal and you'll wanna use white, either white chalk, white charcoal, white gouache, you could use white gouache at the end to put your lightest lights. Um, and that works really, really good. You want to uh, blend carefully. If you're going to use a paper stump and you're using charcoal, like I believe you've done, Lana, charcoal and white pastel or white charcoal, you, you want to be careful around that white. You want to blend it, but you want to be careful because that stump just carries that charcoal everywhere and it can make a big dirty mess. I 
I, I might develop your shadows a little bit more on that, Lana. Um, it looks great. I would maybe have, I'm not sure what you're looking at. If you're looking at the one we have on here, I'm assuming you are. Let me take this off for a minute, this apple. Yeah. So it, it could be a little darker in the occlusion shadow, which is down on the very bottom of the table, right under the apple. That is the darkest dark. And that could be a tiny bit darker. So that's what, that's what I love. That was what my goal was on this for myself is to push, uh, when we were doing the sketchbook exercises, um, you guys would draw something every day. And I found, and Denise encouraged me with this, I found that if I went back the next day or later on in the week and used a marker or just darken my darks and lighten my lights. It's so satisfying that next time you work on it because you have fresh eyes and you, um, you push it a little bit more. So I understand if you have to get up and go eat lunch and you, you're like, I'm sick of this. I'm done with this now. I don't have any objectivity about it, but I want to encourage you to come back to it, push it one more degree than you normally would. And it's so satisfying. It's just like, if you're so thirsty and you finally get a drink of water, you're like, oh, that's so good. And it just feels that way when you're, when you're working. It's just so satisfying. But that's all I would see, Lana, is I would darken that shadow under the apple if you're hearing me. Um, and maybe develop the shadow a little bit more on the apple. There's um, a lot of stuff going on in the shadows. If you're using um, charcoal or graphite, there's a lot of variety of shadow um, intensity in there. If you're using paint, there's a lot of different temperature changes in a shadow. So you have to train yourself to look for these things and push it, push it a little bit more instead of just making it one value and I'm done. I hope that was helpful. Let me find the image again in case some of you are using it. There it is. Another observation I've made with the Zoom classes and Zoom meetings, oh, Norma's battery died, um, is that there's a lot of silence at times. There's awkward silences. People are afraid to uh, interrupt and, <laughs> and jump in. Um, and um, that's okay. That's just a part of the Zoom uh, reality. <laughs> it's a different way of communicating. And so I'm, I'm learning to be okay. Uh, thanks, Lana, for your, for your note. It's a little chat se section. I always forget to open that up. And I've got four chats that I've missed so far. Um, Ella had to leave early. Um, and Peach said, you can use fixative. That's right, Peach, but it changes the color. Uh, if you use it on pastel, it will, it can really change the pastel. In fact, I've ruined pastels before. I have a little sample in my studio that I show you the sprayed orange and the unsprayed orange, and you can see how it darkens it. It makes the particles of pastel um, melt together. And so I think it's important to be careful if you are gonna spray. Uh, Daniel Green, um, one of my first teachers would say that you could use a fixative very sparingly uh, if you lose the tooth of your pastel. It will give you, it will add a little bit of a layer of tooth so that you can put one more layer on top. So if you're trying to, to record a color or a value and it won't stick, just falling off, then you can put a little bit of fixative. But I always take the can and I'll spray it uh, I'll do a, a trial spray first to get any splatters out, make sure that the nozzle is clear, and I'll get back from the, the page, I'll lay it flat, I get back from it, or no, I, I think I usually sit it up, so that way if anything drips, it doesn't drip on it, and I'll just do a very light mist from a distance and slowly get a little bit closer. But do realize that uh, sometimes the spray will yellow your paper, will yellow your charcoal, it will darken it, um, pastels and drawings need to be behind glass 
if they're, you know, frame worthy. If they're in your sketchbook, it's a great um, tool to just put some wax paper, like I said, or vellum in there to keep them from smudging if, if they're important to you. Um, if they make the grade. Any, any other comments or questions? Everybody's just drawing away. Go right ahead. I'll stay nearby. I started late, so I'll stay on here a while. I should have brought my sketchbook down to be sketching with y'all. Is that Sammy with you, Teresa? Hey, Sammy. Are y'all working on basic shapes together? Well, we she picked out a. I think it's there, yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful! I love it, Sammy. But it is hard to do. We've decided. We printed that. <laughs> oh, nice! Just so getting you, started. <laughs> very nice. Oh, beautiful. That's we're learning, like we're we're using charcoal, and then we got charcoal. We got the pencils, and we're learning already about the difference from when to use them. So that's good. I love that. And listen, nothing takes the place of you experimenting. You know, I don't know why we get so, like Peach would say, precious about things that you know it's a piece of paper for Pete's sake. You know, or it's a canvas that was five bucks or three bucks or whatever. Um, if you're worried about it you know, use, use materials that aren't expensive while you're, while you're playing, but they're nothing like experimenting for yourself to see what these materials do. And I think sometimes we just need a, um, a little nudge to try something new and to see it used in front of us. So I love that. And I love Sammy that you're in here doing it too, because listen, if you get some of this stuff right now, you're going to be amazing and this it whether you use it to make a living with I tell my younger students this especially or you just use it for your own joy and your own um, therapy and you know to delight yourself with it's just so valuable and the more you know the more you understand that's why I'm such a big stickler for the academics of this um, like Stephen Bauman was talking about, it just seemed overwhelming to learn about all the muscles in the body. He didn't say muscles, but he said, you know, trying to learn all this stuff is just, is too much. I'll never get anything done. But little by little, you know, I watch, I have a video on my YouTube page by Rick Casali, who's a sculptor and a painter. And when he did a demo, he let me video it. It's fabulous. It's so good. It's so filled with information. But when he rolled those uh, muscles that go down the back of our neck, I can't remember what they're called now. He rolled these long pieces of clay like snakes and he stuck them on the back of the head right here and right here. And then he rolled them around. And now when I draw a figure, I look for those muscles because I know that one muscle in the neck. And so um, Igor would always tell us in his classes to open up an anatomy book and leave it open. And, and glance at it. You don't have to memorize every muscle and every bone, but, but train yourself. If you're gonna be a, a, um, an artist who does figurative work, you know, learn the muscles, learn the bones. Um, the more you know, the better your artwork will be and the easier it will be. It will get easier because you know what you're doing. So all that stuff helps. Okay, I'm getting some pictures here. Yeah, it's going to take longer, Peach. And it, it, but the whole first thing is to get that thing on there. And then you start with your values. You start, you know, taking them apart, blending them out, erasing, pulling things up. Have you got pretty good paper that's going to erase for you? Yeah, so-so. Okay. That looks good. Remember, I'm not sure what your um, point of view is, but remember if your eye level remember to check the top of that little hat box and make sure that because sometimes it'll look like it's spilling out, but check the, the, the height of that elliptical shape and see how that compares with the front of that box. So it looks good. It just kind of, 
And I got a ping pong ball and a huge thing and then a couple of <laughs> meters. And I'm trying to fit them all on this piece of paper and it's not working. I know. That's where, and that's what I didn't demonstrate, but that's where I'll do a quick little um, rough draft, like in 30 seconds, where I just lay it on there very lightly so that it can be wiped off with the tissue. But I go ahead and make a spot for everything to, before I begin drawing any details. And that's tried and true um, habit for me that if I don't, even I'm getting ready to start a big 30 by 40 pastel portrait. And I will do the same thing. I'll do quick gesture drawing. I'll look for rhythmic uh, patterns and designs in there. And I will not invest in any details until I'm sure that my shapes are in the right spot laying on the canvas. So it's a time saver for sure. But just check that elliptical shape. That's where we get off. And make sure that the um, box is flat, that your horizontal lines are horizontal. Looks like it's going a little bit up. King Tower of Pisa. Tower of Pisa, yeah. You gotta watch those Pisas. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad you're working from life. That's the very best thing we can do. I have to, I, I just, I just have to. Yeah, it's totally I fine. I feel that way than if I'm um, looking at somebody else's drawing. I much prefer if I'm trying to do the shadow thing to do it from the real deal. Yeah. I learn more that way. I do too. And it's, um, it's helpful. The red, the pink or red colors sometimes are challenging because it's hard to tell what value that is. The color is so strong. So that's why I have some gray cloths. Even if you just use a dish towel, I have white cloths and I have different values of gray because that helps me really see, or I'll take a picture of it and grayscale it on my phone so that I can decide the values. Because again, color just throws all the values sometimes off and it's very hard for you to gauge them against each other. And there's no pressure um, on working during the class. There's no pressure on showing everybody your work. I wanna state that several times. Um, I always say in my classes that guard your work sometimes because if you get your early efforts judged by other people and it yanks you around, you know, part of our, our Facebook group is called, it's called a Pass to Creativity, Overcoming Obstacles to, do, to Creating. And one of the obstacles is um, people's comments you know, don't let them judge early efforts because it can knock you around. Denise, jump in there. I do have to say though, our page on Facebook is a very safe, encouraging place. Yes. And although negative comments can really tear you down, the positive ones that we all try to offer each other can really spur you on. So I tell people, you know, um, my, my best today, in so many words, my best today, 10 years ago, was not, you can't compare things. Right. We can only encourage each other. And that's why I love to see other people's work, just to be able to have the opportunity to encourage someone else to keep going. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, show, I, I, I encourage people to show what they do but do it in a safe place. Yes. And that side, that page is a extremely, I don't believe anybody's going to find anything except support and uh, encouragement. Amen. Thank you for, for bringing that up, Denise. And I, I, early on, I made that a public page because I thought, well, I know a lot of artists and, and then uh, at the request of a couple of students, I, I made it a private group. And I'm glad I did because it is just, I, had, I have somebody that keeps popping up that wants to join and I don't know who sh she is. And I went to her page and there's nothing to do with art on it. Um, so I have not approved her request. Um, again, I want you to know that I will make sure to monitor. I'll be admin. I'll make sure that if, you know, I make sure that I know people that are on the page and I think that's important. So 
Thank you for saying that, Denise. That's a good, some good points. Oh, good. Thank you, Carol. I thought it was you. I wanted to make sure though. I'm going to add you to my contacts. Okay. So glad to have you. And listen, um, it, it is, it, it's just different for everybody. And that's Catherine, this is, is, is a, a, a comment for you as well in teaching. Um, everybody goes at such different paces. Um, yeah, we all have different things going on. I'm, I'm taking care of a baby and a teenage grandson almost every day now. Um, I'm pretty harassed with time slots to get to do this, to get to draw or paint. And so, you know, we, we should all have different things going on. Again, my goal and my hope for you is to have a connection right now, especially during this pandemic, um, with other artists to have that camaraderie. I have a another um, group, and Peach, I know you have to go in a minute. I just sent you another one. Um, trapezius, yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm late on looking at my chats over here. Um, I have a group called Inspire Group that I used to have in the studio once a month, and people would just stay after class and bring their lunch, and we talked about different obstacles to creating, and, and inspiration, what helps us get through those. And um, I haven't been doing that lately just because of my life circumstances, but I will get back to it. I have a Zoom group created for that. And it's wonderful just sharing different things. We all face a lot of the same struggles with this. So um, I believe that is so important. And I, I don't let finances be an issue. Um, God works it all out for us. We, you know, we've had a crimp too, but we've, just when I need it, money will come through and I really do not care. I want people to come on here. If you have people, you know, people that are, that need this right now, please share my information with them and do not let, I do, I will not ask anybody about finances. Um, this is so important to me and I could have 50 people on here. So, um, I'm just, you know, I'll make sure everybody's muted because <laughs> that'll get a little bit crazy, but, um, so, yes. so can we send them your um, your text, a text, or how do I let them know, how do I let you know that, because I have a couple of um, people um, around in my neighborhood that are self-taught, yeah. and I've told them about you, so. In my um, newsletters, I always have a little, I, I try to have a little link that says share this with a friend. Um, so you can either send them to my website, which has a subscribe button. Um, or I'm only sending this weekly information out to my current students and I send out one newsletter a month, but, um, I'll try to remember, I'm going to make myself a note to put, uh, share this newsletter, all my newsletters, my two a week that go to you guys always have the zoom link on them. Okay. So I can so share that. You could share, share the zoom newsletter. link. Yeah. And I mean, I trust your judgment with people. Um, yeah. I, it's not an open, I know some of my other, my Al Anon meeting, or my husband's 12-step uh, meeting, um, they had some pornography. <laughs> they had some people just bomb the meeting with pornography. And so, you know, it's a, it's a link that I don't want to just put out publicly for everybody. Because again, this is a safe place. And um, my studio is a safe place. I work hard to keep, to keep it that way. Um, so as far as, you know, that's why I'm not having class and I don't know when in the foreseeable future I will. Christy, did you get the, the uh, Genesitas? Yes, I just got it. Hold on. Let me look. It's, okay. it's not the whole picture though. Hold on. I click it. It's a video. Okay. Oh, a video? No. A video? Yeah, I saw it. It's just, she's keeping bad company. <laughs> Okay, so all I see is a little, a portion of it. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. it's pretty though. I like it. I see a corner in the little, the little design up in the left corner. It, it, Hi, Jackie. It, it showed up. It's like a little angel. Oh, yes, I see it. Can you see it? Yes. And mine that looks like so Dali. Pretty. It does. <laughs> you know Dali, right? Yes, I do. Guy. Surrealist. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I don't know how. I don't know if this is. 
Well, I see both of them. I see your, you've got a nice hard edge on the edge of yours, uh, Grace, on the left. And you've yeah. got softer edges on the right. You've got totally white area. You've got some really nice blended transitions. Uh, Jeanette, the same thing with you. Um, it's hard. I don't know if you guys are finding this, but it's hard to find, to get back to the really white paper. Yes. Um, it's very hard. So that's where, and even the white pastel or the white chalk doesn't get clean enough. So um, I like the little, I've bought myself a little tube of white gouache, which is a watercolor, but it's a, um, it's not transparent. Um, Denise is giving me the thumbs up and Catherine. Um, is, it's it, magic. It's magic. You can go back in there and you can clean things up. I have a little segment from Daryl Steele, who Carla turned us on to. Um, I have, uh, he let me video some things with him and I've got some segments where he uses white gouache with charcoal and you're going to be blown away by that. I'm going to show that to you guys next week. Um, but that looks beautiful. So you could go back on that, Jeanette, and in those white areas, you could put a little bit of that white gouache. Yeah or white pastel if you wanted to to get mm -hmm. it to be clean white gouache then go sure. the gouache is just not it's a watercolor it's just not transparent and what's beautiful is i'll put a little highlight sometimes on the eyes with gouache if you mess it up and you don't like it after it dries you can take a little exacto knife and pop it off mm. um it's that you know it's it's if you do a little gob of it on the eye it'll just pop right off so it, it's, a, it's a neat little tool that I would have never thought to use if Daryl hadn't shared that. Daryl also uses the mechanical pencils. So I haven't covered that yet. So next week I'll have a shorter segment so that we can spend more time drawing. Um, yes. But I want to show you, I want to continue showing you some, some more drawing techniques. Yeah, yeah, the next yeah. Okay, go. Judy. All those yeah. Spanish yeah. girls talking. I have to mute y'all. <laughs> okay. Um, looks beautiful. Keep drawing. I think anything that you draw in any, any time the pencil goes to paper, you're advancing your skills. So keep doing it. Keep, even if you're just doodling, even if you're practicing cross hatching, you're making spirals. Uh, just let yourself, give yourself the joy of getting to do this. It's just good for your brain. It's good for your soul. It'll make you much nicer to be around. People will will be blessed by the atmosphere that you create when you get to create. So are y'all signing off? Bye girls. Love y'all. Thank you. Be hey, careful with your walking. I'm staying on if anybody wants to stay okay. on. Yes. I was just going to tell you, I've learned something important. Yes. what did you learn, <laughs> Teresa? This is what I have so far. Let me highlight. I, start, you. I started on the right hand side. I should have started on the left and gone over Oh, are you running out of room? No, or you're laying your hand. hand in it. Get you another piece of paper right. or a, uh, yeah, a little card stock. But right, good, yeah, I was telling Sammy about that. Good lesson. And I'm going to send y'all the link <laughs> to those drawing gloves, too. You're going to love those. I'm going to have to order me some. Oh, yeah. Sammy was telling me about those. She said they've used them at school. I was telling her about the guy that did the uh, tape on his side of his hand and then put wax paper on it and she said oh we have a glove we put over our <laughs> so. oh no isn't that awesome yeah you learn something new every day every day thank you christy you're welcome so glad you were signed on well i'm gonna go ahead and leave and i've enjoyed it so and, glad uh, you joined us carol I'll, I'll stay connected with you and I'm going to be sending you an email shortly. So, um, Oh, great. And you, you feel will. free to pop on anytime. Don't feel any pressure about it. If you just okay. want to pop on and listen for a few minutes and then pop back off, or if it's not your thing, no worries either. Um, loved having you. And again, just try in the, especially in this pandemic, try to stay connected to other artists. I think it's important. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, it, it is. And God, if God put it in our hearts to do it, you know, we need to use it and enjoy it. It's something he's, it's a gift that he's given us to enjoy. Even if we, you know, we said that we did the sketchbook series. Even if you give yourself five minutes each day to do something fun in your sketchbook, it's, um, it'll be so good for your heart and your spirit. So it's so good to meet you. I'm glad you were here. You too. You too. And thank, thank you very you. much. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Sweetie. Then you just hit that. Yeah, she got it. The little leave thing. 
Catherine. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say thank you all for letting Aww. me just sit in. It's really been a blessing. Um, I, ha I have, um, I feel encouraged to try to pursue it. I think that most of the people, most of my students um, are very leery about going online. And I'm just really hoping that we can make it work because I think you're right. We need to be connected. If we don't have the social piece, uh, it's really easy to become disheartened and discouraged. And I think about, I, I tell my students what you said too. You know, even five minutes a day. I don't play the piano. We have a beautiful grand piano. If I spent five minutes a day, I could learn how to play. And I'd be greatly encouraged by doing it. So I think, um, I think that it's important for us to stay connected. Absolutely. And the, it, it is so rewarding when you do challenge yourself to learn, you know, some of my older students that have jumped in and challenged themselves to learn something new, you know, with technology. And I've told them, listen, we'll get on early. We'll get on before class. We'll work out the bugs. Um, and you just feel so good. It's so good for our brains to learn something new. Um, and this is the way of the future. I think a lot of things are going to video conferencing. So, um, so glad you were here and please feel free to jump in any, any week, any Tuesday. We'd love to have you. Um, it, it may help you get more familiar. You may already be familiar with zoom, but, um, it may help. There may be something that I do that's helpful to you. And we're just delighted to have you was a great, a great group that you're with. And I have to say, I'm so surprised at how much I don't know <laughs> about so many things. <laughs> Me too. What kind of, what kind of uh, class do you teach? Watercolor. A watercolor. Oh, oh. well, we might have to take your class, girl. Well, awesome. I'm telling you, you guys, you know, if you get the drawing part down, I really think if you can get the drawing, if you can do values, you know, if you really get a handle on values and edges, texture, and how to do that, you know, you could fly mm. with watercolor. Any medium, it, you know, you have to figure out a few things about the medium, but if you learn those foundational things, it carries over into all of it. So it absolutely does. It mm. absolutely does. And I think the watercolor pencils and the, um, well, the graphite pencils that were described um, Derwent makes, uh, makes some, I haven't used the generals, but, um, with the little, um, with the little water brush, that yeah. little water brush. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I know. Um, great for plein air sketching. Yeah. I love that too. Well, thank you all. I'm signing off. Well, good to have you. Good to meet you. And again, pop back on any time. Um, we're just you. delighted to have you. Thank you. You're welcome. Denise, you had something. You had your hand raised. Were you just waving? I was waving goodbye, but <laughs> it has been, it has been very interesting. Um, I, I don't care how much you do something or how long you do something there's always something more to learn. And, Amen. and, um, that's what I call dessert learning. So, uh, I, I really enjoyed watching today. I hate that I missed, I'll have to do my, uh, sphere or whatever, you know, <laughs>